today we've managed to prize Shelley out of her Rover's return bedroom, or rather Sally Lindsay, who <laughs> plays the Coronation Street trouble barmaid. Now, welcome, Sally. I know you're not one and the same person. No, not anymore, no. <laughs> well, we'll go into that a bit later. But I thought that maybe it was so traumatic playing the part that I'd comfort you in the form of chocolate cake. Oh, fantastic. Anyway, I thought it was a good start. And joining us later for talk of relationship dilemmas is my good friend Maria McCurlane, whose own life is rather more, I'd say, EastEnders oh, than Corrie. Well, then it was that exciting, frankly. <laughs> it's very much Celebrity Love Island, I think, at the moment. Oh, that, sounds, that sounds exciting no, enough, No, I'm it? a dull one, I think. Oh. <laughs> well, well, we'll vote on it later. Thank also you. joining us, American comedian John Lenehan, who came to Britain for the summer 20 years ago and still can't afford his fair home. <laughs> it's, uh, it, I still call this my trip, 20 years later. Uh, but it's a nice country. It just needs a roof. <laughs> <laughs> so welcome to all my guests. Chocolate cake. Now, this is, in a way, the easiest chocolate cake you could ever make. I mean, do you bake much? <laughs> no, no, that's not. So you don't I'm absolutely any... rubbish. But um, this is when you can do this cake. Uh, you mm. really can. Okay. Okay. You've yeah. got to believe me. It's incredibly simple. It's a slightly odd cake in that it is made with cola, and also oh. that it's made in a saucepan to start off with. I know it's a, it, it sounds odd, but it really works. So it's a kind of three-stage recipe. Mm -hmm. The first stage is it's got butter and cocoa in here. You've got to have butter in a cake. I mean, you, you, you shouldn't ever apologise for things like butter and sugar in a cake. And these days, you're always made to a bit. You know, you don't have to eat the whole cake. No, you, can. No. <laughs> you can. You can. It's been done. But, uh, so there's butter and cocoa. And really important to use cocoa, not drinking chocolate. Yeah. Okay, that's my that's the that's me being stern. And that's why why is it because it's just a bit more it's bitter really, or richer. Yes, it's incredibly intense. Yeah. Whereas drinking chocolate is much milder and it's already sweet and there's some milk in it. So mm. we don't want to mess around. We want to go straight, you know, for the heavy duty stuff. Mm -hmm. Some cola in my nice little jug. That's that's interesting. That's that step there. That's easy enough. And then obviously you need flour. Okay, so there's flour, sugar, bicarb just to help it raise. And some salt. Oh. That's easy enough. You see, look, that, so it's really stirring. And stirring doesn't take too much out of anyone. No. I always manage to spill things over me, but that's a separate matter. Yeah. I used Would to you make like cakes. to do some stirring? I used to make cakes with my gram, but I was about eight, stood on a box. Well, you're not, you don't need to stand I don't need to stand in a box anymore. You're... I'm a grown-up. Yeah, oh, thank start. you. I've got a job. Ooh, you're that's exciting. And then the <laughs> other stage, so we've got the dry ingredients, we've got some wet ingredients, and that's buttermilk. The thing about buttermilk is that it really makes a cake crumb sort of tender. It really works well. You can buy it from the supermarket. Otherwise, natural yoghurt, to be honest, is fine, as long as it's not the thick-set sort. Mm -hmm. Some vanilla. And an egg. It's all coming back to me now. You see, look, now, I, would you like to... I'm going to swap and you can stir that oh, one. Oh, I'm clearly a natural. You really are. Mm. OK? <laughs> see, look, you've done it already. Could you pull this into here for me? Oh, is, that, is, it, is it done already? Yes. Oh, oh, oh. That looks a bit lumpy to me. Right. Right. <laughs> yeah, it's going to be lumpy, but that's oh, the right. thing about the heat there. So oh, we'll stop right. it. So do you cook at all? Or do you find... I mean, you must work pretty long hours. Yeah, so got time. well, yeah, I'm not really... I'm more a sous chef, to be honest. I'm, this is what You're I do. You're very this good at it. This kind of thing, yeah. I, uh, uh, no. So look, that's the liquid ingredients in, the hot oh. liquid. That's the cola, cocoa and butter. Cola. Cola. I like that cola thing. That's different, isn't it? I love... I have something about what cola and cooking. Did you just... I came across it. Here, do you want to have a go? Yeah, I've now made, I? put the chocolate all over the handle, but you can... I came across a version of this um, in America, oh, but right. I wanted to do a simpler one so that you didn't have to worry about it in terms of this. As you can see, really, this is all the recipe is. So I it could actually difficult. do this. <laughs> I'm it. I know. I to break it to you. But this is for real. It's not a fake cake. Oh, Lord. Okay, my mother's so going to be so proud. I'm sure she is already. <laughs> I need you to be baking cakes to... OK, go, that's it. it. Look. Now pour that into the tin. Yeah. And apart from the baking, which, as you know, the oven does, you don't have to do anything. <laughs> <laughs> it's, yeah. That's it. That's done. Great. I'm going to put that in. I can leave this here in case you feel like... Are you, Looking at uh, it later. You, well, you don't know who will be off camera, later. you know. <laughs> no, you know, in my world, it doesn't have to be off camera. Oh, right, okay. okay, so this just goes in the oven. 
Great. There's 180 of them for about, I don't know, 30 or 40 minutes. And the reason why I'm vague is I always think you can get into trouble with oven timers because every oven is different. Mm. So just stick a cake tester in, and if it's kind of relatively dry, it's ready. And if you haven't got a cake tester, you can use a stick of spaghetti. Oh, Did you know that? No. Uncooked stick of spaghetti, you just put it in. And so if you see there's lots of wet sort of chocolatey batter adhering, yeah. you know it needs another five minutes or so. Are you ready to ice the cake? Oh, yes. Because you know the miracle of television is... <laughs> This what we made earlier. <laughs> <laughs> like yes. Well, do you want to come in well, and say, say that? that? Here's well. what we made earlier, viewers. <laughs> <laughs> so the icing, I'm not bothering to wash up this. I'm using it again. No, I, I never what, do. You know, no, quite. <laughs> Even afterwards, you yes. just quickly, it will be fine. So it's more or less the same as the cake in the sense that okay. there's butter, cola, cocoa, vanilla, and now there's icing sugar. So it should be hot enough. We're going to try. If you hear a loud sizzling, it's because I'm impatient and I always have things that, like men, I always put the fire at maximum yeah. rather than waiting. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. See, look, it's nearly melted, melted now. Fantastic. It's really easy icing. The only thing is, you do have to, there's one job I hate in the kitchen, which is you have to sieve the icing sugar, it has lumps. Uh -huh. But you probably don't mind that. If you like being a sous chef, oh, no, I like, really I like that. That's yeah. the cola going in. I'm sort of like a four-year-old. I like to know where it begins and finishes, really. But there's something, no, I, and if you're really lazy like me, and I get a food processor out, and I put the icing sugar in the food processor, <laughs> and I just give it a quick blitz, and that's it, sieved. Fantastic. And actually, it's easier to wash up than a sieve, which I can never get all those bits out at the I end. I know. I stay there for years. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, that's my kitchen. <laughs> See mine. <laughs> okay, so that's the icing sugar going in now. Brilliant. Mm. This nice sweet dust coming to spray us. Fantastic. And the thing is about this, as you can see, it's quite an old-fashioned looking cake. But yeah. I quite like that because I think you get all these sort of new, fancy, layered up things. And I rather like a cake just to have one layer and some icing that isn't neat on top, it just drips down the oh, sides. Yeah. And also, when you, when you go to a restaurant and you get your pudding and it's sort of that big. Oh, yes, when it's in a miniature. And you just go, what, what's the point of that? <laughs> wouldn't fill my hollow tooth, as my dad used to say. <laughs> but, yeah, I'm not into that at all. I like, you know, no point in ordering it. And then it's about £70. <laughs> so, do you like your food, or are you...? <laughs> yes, I, I do, I do, yeah, I do. I think, you know, we lo I love eating out. It's fabulous, you know. When you, when you find a new restaurant that's great, it's the most exciting thing <laughs> and serves nice wine, I know. So <laughs> down that's, that's my line. OK, so there's a teeny bit of icing on top. Mm, it start, Ooh, it sets fab. pretty pretty quickly, but what's rather great is that if you eat it warm, it's like a pudding, say, rather than a cake. It looks like a, a proper old-fashioned cartoon cake. I know, it? it's doesn't brilliant. it? I know, it's nice and old-fashioned. So, there Lovely. it is. <laughs>I did say I'd try not to ask you a question just as you were shuffling into no, your mouth. Yeah. That's the way it happens in life, so I won't yeah. apologise too much. Yeah. But <laughs> I wanted to ask you something, mm -hmm. which is, do you find it quite a responsibility playing a part like that? I mean, just do women who've been in a similar situation or are still mm. sort of ask, expect you to have the answers or do they expect you to be going through it? Well, I've, I've never, fortunately, touched wood, been through anything like that in my life, but... Um, I've had so much massive response from women and men, actually, who've been in a situation where they, f they've, they feel like they've been um, demoralised and um, manipulated mentally. And, uh, and it's certain scenes for people, it's like... Um, I've had letters and it was a scene where he got rid of your mother on the phone and that's, that was so profound to me because mm. my mother didn't, wasn't at my wedding and there was that. And then I'm an agoraphobic, I can't get out of my, you know, and, and you just think, good Lord, this is, this is right. It's, it's amazed me, actually. But I think um, also, I mean, in a way, that the important thing about it happening in a soap is that, you know, it's a way people can really see it about ordinary life. It's not like watching a documentary no. or something like that, which no. in a way may be about real life. Yeah, absolutely. But no, it's true. And it, it, people take it, obviously, it's, you were in people's living rooms for five yeah. times a week, so they take it to heart. But women have, I think women sometimes have a, a thing which is a slightly apologetic, which is, oh, people are going to be disappointed because they've seen you in one way and then somehow you're going to be a disappointment in real yeah. life. Yeah. And it's the same way, I hope I'm not betraying anything, that no. you, when we were 
you know, talking earlier, and you said, oh, I'm not really going to be wearing this. And actually, you look lovely. But there's something that women do, which is straight away apologise po or start no, thinking it's that, that other women, particularly, it's not men, they're thinking that other women are judging them yeah. and judging them harshly. Well, it's funny at the moment, I think, in the press, that other women uh, I, I judge other women harder than the men do. Yes. And I don't know where that's come well, from. Well, that's the whole thing about weight, which is that <laughs> yeah. when I, if I'm talking to a man, I never think... Oh, this, you know, I, oh, I wish I was thin like that. Yeah. But when I see women, sometimes, you know, look, no, look, you know that they really because men really kind don't of care. Judge, you know, it's true. Men, no, but it's not that men don't care. Is that I don't think men have this obsession with thinness mm. and thinking that thinness is equated to beauty and wonderfulness. Yeah. Yes. Well, I had to lose <laughs> a stone for the storyline because he manipulated her into thinking she wasn't good enough. You know, yeah. and, and the, the line was, yeah. if you lost a little bit of weight, you could be really pretty as well, and you could look like these people in the magazines. And this was the manipulation. And Shelley as a character had never, never crossed her mind before because yeah. as a character she's in a backstreet pub, she's slightly decent looking and she's much better looking than the batters biz. And you know, and she just thought, oh, I'm great. And nobody had ever said that to her before. It has, and it was, an, it, it was an interesting concept. So, so I lost weight and every single journalist said to me, do you feel better because of that? Oh, that's and I terrible. went, no, I don't, actually. Has There's anyone only ever said reason. that to you in real life? Yeah. Though? Most people sit, when they meet me, they always go, oh, you're quite thin in real life, know, aren't you? Do they say that? Always. And you're like, oh God, what do I look like? I know, I always think... <laughs> I, but I always think this is something, again, we're talking about that what women do to other women is that they always say, oh, you've lost weight. And I'm afraid to say, I don't think it's nice. I always think, oh, do I look like Bessie Bunter? The first thing people want <laughs> to be nice, that the first thing they say to you yeah. is you've lost weight. It's Whereas very actually, true. I think most women go up and down and it's like, I never know really whether... You know, I'm, I'm fatter or thinner than the last time I saw someone, because it could be either. Well, I mean, I always go between two dress sizes. I have since I was 12, and I don't have a problem with it. It's never stopped me acting, it's never stopped my career, I've always worked, and it's never become an issue, apart from nowadays. It's not an issue for me, but it does infuriate me, because you can see... Uh, women who are my size, or, or girls at my size, and they're naturally my size, mm -hmm. and they... And they're, they're, they're worried about everything. I mean, kids as young I'm as no, nine listen, and ten. I know that because you know I know that because I've seen my daughter and her friends who are eleven, and some of them already are, you know, thinking they should yeah. go on diets. It's terrible. It's, it's, it's heartbreaking, and you think, no, you should. You, all you should think about is what you're having for your tea, and have you done your own work? Yes, I'm always thinking about what I'm having for my yeah, tea. I am. <laughs> <laughs>well, Sally and I have joined Maria McCurlin and John Lenehan, and I want to talk about a new report from America that claims rather contentiously that families who live in cities lead healthier, longer lives than those in the country. Does that surprise you? It certainly surprises me, because you would think that obviously healthy living in the country, but also I think if, even if you have a shorter life in the country, you have a better quality of life. <laughs> <laughs> so it's not quantity. Great try. No, no, the point is, is if, if you're in the country, it just seems like a longer life, because it's so dull. <laughs> Isn't there something to do with when people get to a certain age, they move out of the city life because you slow down? So you're absolutely suited. So you've got more suited. people dying in the country because <laughs> you're yeah, going there, because they're, they're moving out well, there. Well, they, they, yes. people think they live longer because nobody notices they're dead. They're just sitting there. <laughs> Do you, I mean, you live in the country, I know you've got a rose-clad cottage. Well, actually, it, it looks, it's like a little bit of, um, of an oasis. It's not, it's only 20 minutes outside Manchester. Yeah. But I suppose it's sort of villagey, yeah. Yes. Um, but I don't, I sort of toyed with living in the town and, and near Granada, but I just think I'd just be in bars every night. I'd never get to work, <laughs> so I just decided to move out a bit, so I have to go home. Because the city life is very, oh, it's, it's, it's contagious isn't it you want to be but are you very rural is your cottage very rural oh, no, do you have long it's walks not, and... it's not that far away from town i mean the great thing about living in manchester if you're you, you literally drive 40 minutes out and you're in the middle of rolling fields so you're never that far away it's a little bit different from london i think london's a different animal altogether because it's so the traffic is i find mind-blowingly dull i can't uh, uh, i just can't bear it and and sweaty tubes and stuff. That but it's exactly the same. Sweaty you, tubes. you live in the country, it takes you 15 minutes yeah. to go and buy a pint know, of milk. It takes me 15 minutes to go two blocks. Yeah. It's the same thing. Yeah, I mean, you I have think to say it really anything depends to anyone. about people. I mean, you're, you're, when you're in any sort of rural area, you're very much 
you know, around people who are this happen to be near, mm. aren't you? Whereas, even though it's absurd, because in a city often you might spend, you know, a long time travelling to see someone, you tend to, to see people just you're choosing to see. Yeah. And I think you do have to be really prepared just to get along I with it. Yeah, exactly. A friend of mine said, who lives in the country, said in London, or in, in any city, Manchester, you're very choosy. So there's actually more lonely people in big cities, because in the country, you have to make do, you have to get on yeah. with your neighbours. But in, in a London, way. You, have, you have a choice, you know, if you don't like your neighbours, you don't have to talk to them because it's London. But then we find, <laughs> then we find people... pity, though. I do think it's a pity. I happens. do quite like oh, that thing. Uh, that's what I like people. about the city is the choice. The other thing about, you know, even the foxes don't want to live in the country anymore. Like, you know, <laughs> I mean, that's yes. the problem. I've actually organized the Cricklewood hunt. <laughs> So uh, we have all the, all the neighbors, we come in, we wear donkey jackets, we wear our kids' scooters, and we, we go around and then we corner the foxes and we feed them then. Of course. Yeah. <laughs> we don't have dogs, we have cats. They don't actually chase the foxes, they just go. <laughs> Can you see yourself being completely countryfied any time or you're going to stick to No, I couldn't. I'd, I'd, I'd die of boredom, I've got to say. And it's not really in the country. I suppose compared to Manchester, it's the country, my house. But yeah. it's not really in the country. But it's, um, it's village. It's very villagey. Yes. Is it but on the no. lot by Rover's Return? Have you got the set design? <laughs> yes. It's to just build it. <laughs> yes, because yes, I'm so important to the show. Um, no, <laughs> oh, God, no. Um, well, also, yeah, with your current storyline, you don't have far to go there. <laughs> I don't like to get out. <laughs> no. Are um, you going to be stay city-fied or country-fied? No, I think I'm certainly moving towards my dotty dotage when I shall be sort of running around oh, smelling of cat's weed. Never. <laughs> never. <laughs> never. Don't, don't, never. You're going to stay in your... If the doctor tells me I have a year to live, I'll move to Dorset, so it'll feel like five or six. We'll <laughs> be getting hate mail from I'm, Dorset now. I'm I have this fantasy now that I'm going to go to the country, but I know I won't when I'm such a city girl. Yeah, I, yeah. I make a great concession, though, that I will wear brown eyeliner, not black, when I'm in the country. <laughs> <laughs> Sally, John, Maria and I are talking about relationship issues and we have some callers on the line. First up, I believe it's Rosie from London. Hello, Nigella. Hi, Rosie. So what is your particular problem? Um, well, basically, I've one of my best friends named John. Um, I've started to kind of fall for him and every now and then we've kind of been getting drunk and kissing, but he's got like three or four other girlfriends, so it's a little bit awkward, and I don't know whether I should say something to him or what. I don't really know what to do about it. I'm kind of stuck. Well, you say you don't know what to do about it. I mean, you do know it's not going to have a good outcome. I yeah. mean, if he's got three or four other girlfriends. Yeah, but he's like one of my best friends, and they're like just random, so I don't know. It's all a bit weird. I don't know if I should say something to him or... I think you've got to be prepared to that you you know you will lose him as a friend. But if you know if it's worth taking that risk, because I think clearly, you know, it's not it's not I, meant to be a great love affair. Yeah, I don't know, I Sally. I sort do of you... think if, with all due respect, if it was going to happen, it would have happened by now. I Sorry, think, Rosie, if you if he's if you've got other best friends that you can fall back on, then have sex with him and be prepared <laughs> to say goodbye to him because I don't think it's going to go into anything else. Exactly. And what's going to happen, if you, if you do carry on, oh, it might, it might be today, it might be tomorrow, he'll turn around, he'll make the, me the woman of his dreams, and you'll be heartbroken. Yes. So, Either yeah. that, Rosie, or tell us what his surname is now, and he'll know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think that's altogether a good idea. But, yeah, thank you. <laughs> but next on the line is Christabel from Winchester. Hello, Nigella. Hello, Christopher. So, would you like to tell us what your problem is? What's my problem is my husband is obsessed with computer games. And when he's not playing on the computer, he's playing on a pinball machine. When he comes home at night, he goes straight on the computer and he probably stops for supper. He does sit down with me for supper. And then he plays on into the middle of the night. You know, See, probably coming to bed sometimes at one I in the morning, having I played really all couldn't. the time. What does he say when you tell him about his computer well, obsession? Well, he sort of says, oh, I'll come in a minute. And then he, and I sort of think he's coming in a minute, and then he goes off and has a break, but goes onto this pinball machine. You've got to learn to play pinball with him, actually. <laughs> he he loves to... me to watch him. He wants, he wants you to walk well, that's, off. That's, that's, that's a touching aspect. Challenge him to a two-hander. <laughs> anyway, but thank you very much, Christabel, and thanks to everyone who's called in. And I want to say that you, audience here, have been really great today. So, uh, as I made a chocolate cake earlier, I wanted to encourage everyone to do the same by giving every single person a Green and Black's chocolate recipe book and enough chocolate to keep them busy. But for one lucky audience member, we've got an even bigger treat. So, audience, if you just look at your keypads and one of them sort of lit up.
The wonders of technology. Oh, no. oh very good. You were quick. I was obviously buzzing there. Yeah. Anyway, congratulations because you have won a special treat, which is your very own chef for the night. Oh, how Enjoy fair. it. Thank wow. you. Thank you. Okay, from heart ache to chicken soup, for me, is like one very small jump. I mean, you can have all the chocolate cakes you want in the world, but there's something about chicken soup. It's just like the cure for all ills, really sort of deep inside. And this is a very, very quick chicken soup. I'm very happy to use a good store-bought chicken stock here. The chicken, I think, you don't want any oil. There's something about chicken soup. It has to feel kind of light. So I have bits of chicken breast meat. Really thin little slithers, a bit like you might in a stir-fry, and I am indeed stir-frying them in this dry, hot pan. They will, in fact, carry on cooking once they're in the stock, and they'll cook pretty quickly because they're so thin, these slithers, but nevertheless, that's it. Now, I think white meat is great in soup, but it does have a slight sort of bland uh, taste. It doesn't really give you a lot of oomph. I need a bit of soy sauce just not only to give all that lovely savouriness in the soup, but also because it makes the chicken have that rather wonderful pan bronze look. Tipping the chicken bits into the soup, and they'll just carry on cooking easily. I'll put that there. Now, I want vegetables, just because I wanted to have a bit of crunch as well. So I've got those little sweet corns that, to be frank, don't taste of an awful lot. Some green beans, I've just halved those. And those are sugar snaps, which some of them have been harmed in some whole. And noodles. I've been slightly lazy here, and I've used those noodles which are already partly cooked, so all you need to do is toss them into a stir-fry pan or, indeed, into this soup. So chicken is really there. In go my little corn on the cobs. Beans, mm, sugar snaps. This is a great meal for children, actually. Mine love it. And um, you can get away with putting many more vegetables in their food than they would normally agree to. And the noodles, that should just come back up hot, but not so boiling or going to burn your tongue. I am very, very bad at dishing up. You'll have seen my clumsiness, but I'm going to try. You see, you just want to hold this out to someone to sort of offer a little culinary embrace. Now, I know some people like their comfort food to be quite bland, but I often think something fiery sort of picks you up a bit. So I've got a few bits of chilli, hope everyone else agrees. Some coriander. Mmm. Please make this tonight. If not tonight, tomorrow night, you know it'll work. Anyway. My witnesses to that, you're going to taste it, you can say. Oh boy. Come and tell me what you think. Oh, I have mm. a very specially fashioned eating utensil for each one oh, of yeah. you. <laughs> very good. I've got asbestos hands, oh. so would you like a little bit first? Ooh, I didn't mean to turn away from you like that. Now, Thank can you. I just say something to you? You should yeah, always something. have yeah. soups and things from the side first or you'll burn your mouth. Okay. Because it's That's hotter in the it. middle. Is this really done? I'm having yeah, it's it really done. quick. I'm doing it from the saucepan. <laughs> Why not? I'm, I do that myself so very, nice. very often. Mm. Okay, well, anyway, that just leaves me time just to burn oh, my hands fam. and to say thank you to Maria McCurlane, John Lenehan, and of course to Sally Lindsay. See you next time. Bye.